Welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast, helping engineers, producers, and artists create professional recordings and mixes, even from home. I'm your host, Mike and Davina. Let's get started. Hey, welcome to the Master Mix Podcast. My name is Mike Navina, and thank you so much for being here with me today. Today, my guest is Justin Weiss, who is a San Francisco-based audio engineer and owner of Trackworks Mastering and Recording. And he's been an engineer for over 25 years, and in that time, he's mastered and recorded and mixed for a wide variety of artists, including artists such as Sammy Hagar, Papa Roach, Matt Nathanson, The Coop, and so many more. He, as you'll hear in this interview, has definitely transformed his business from originally being a full production facility into to focusing now 100% on mastering. And so in this conversation, we get into how that transition happened and why he made those decisions. And in this interview, Justin also gives us a ton of great advice on what it's like to get into the recording business and how to actually start up your own commercial facility. Because for so many people, they just jump all in, but this could be really disastrous. So Justin gives us a ton of great points to think about so that if you're thinking about starting up a studio, you're prepared and you can actually last and run a successful business. So I definitely think you're going to get a lot of value out of this podcast. So let's just jump right into it. Justin Weiss, thank you so much for being on the Master Mix podcast. How are you doing today, man? I'm great. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Well, thanks for being here. For people who might not know your story and how you got into music and ultimately into production and mixing and mastering and all that kind of stuff, can you give us that story? Sure. Um, going all the way back, it starts probably at like age eight when my dad, in the 70s, my dad had one of those old hi-fi systems, reel-to-reel, you know, turntable and big speakers and lots of lights and knobs and meters and moving parts. And I was fascinated as a little like eight year old kid, fascinated with that stuff, not allowed to touch it. Secretly, I touched it a couple of times. But, um, <laughs> then uh, uh, maybe around age 10, I got one of those little desktop dictation cassette recorders that has a little built in microphone. Nice. And I, I was fascinated with recording stuff um, like off the TV, like um, TV theme songs or s songs off the AM radio, just through the little microphone and then playing them back. And, uh, <laughs> I'm, picturing, I'm picturing from like, you know, in Home Alone when Kevin's got the talk boy, he's got like his little <laughs> recorder that he uses to scare off the road. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. sure that wasn't it, but <laughs> something like that. Um, now you're giving me ideas. So, um, <laughs> so um, fast forward. To age 15, I start playing electric guitar, taking lessons, and and maybe age 17, got into a band at, at school. And um, uh, at age 19, I got my first four-track recorder, cassette, you know, analog four-track recorder. This was in, in 1984. They had just come out, these things. And uh, so it was a Fostex X15, and... Uh, I got a little Dr. Rhythm drum machine and was just plugging everything in direct and making little songs, you know, just writing my own little songs. And, and uh, a couple of them came out all right, you know, but it, I was just barely dipping my toes in. Um, kept doing that for uh, until into my late 20s. Like, you know, I ended up with an eight track recorder and uh, recorded a lot of songs um, on my own. And then I got tired of just working jobs that weren't very fulfilling. And so I decided to go to recording school and try to make a living out of it, knowing that it was a competitive field and I might not make it. But I figured if I don't try, I'll never know, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so I was super motivated and made sure that I graduated at the top of my class. And this was California Recording Institute. Um, and they hired me to become an instructor. Wow. And so that was kind of my big break because suddenly I was making a living and getting experience at the same time by being in the school and, you know, teaching students um, recording sessions and mixing labs and things like that. And so uh, about a year into that job, Pro Tools 3 came out, which was when it became a 16-track multi-track that you could actually use you know and so i 
made a deal with the school that I would buy a Pro Tools and let the school use the Pro Tools during the day if in the off hours I could use the studio for free to do sessions that would pay for the Pro Tools. Hmm. And that was the beginning of TrackWorks Studio. And that was in 1995. And so for two years, I was working full-time teaching and almost full-time on the side recording and mixing and mastering. And was re- I got burned out after a couple of years of that. You know, I was still young enough to do it, but I was... I couldn't do that now, those kind of hours. But um, uh, eventually, I in 1997, I moved out to my first little location of my own in, um, in a really bad part of San Francisco near the Tenderloin. That's, so there's a lot of crackheads around. Um, I had a 500-square-foot space for one year. Then I moved to an intermediate-sized studio for a couple of years and lost that space in 99 and moved to where I am now, where I've been in South San Francisco for 22 years Wow! in amazing. the same place. Yeah. And I'm renting. And so it's, it's pretty cool to be able to stay in the same rental for that long. That's amazing. Especially, yeah. And rentals, like I feel like everyone I know that's renting a place right now in, in the Toronto area has been dealing with landlord issues or, you know, there's a bunch of studios shutting down. And so, it, you know, it's to be able to have a place for that long is is quite impressive. I got lucky with a cool landlord who um, just hasn't raised the rent much and I don't bother him. So I recommend to anybody, you know, if you get into a good situation, don't make waves. You know, if you're running a studio or sharing one or whatever, just don't draw attention to yourself because every time they think about you, they think about how much rent you're paying. And so if there's little things that go wrong, you can fix yourself, just do it, you know, and, and don't, don't make yourself a pain. That's great advice. Cause yeah, so many people become demanding and then yeah, the, the landlord's like, ah, screw this. Yeah. Or they start thinking, yeah, you know, you just don't want them thinking about you at all. You just want them to cash the check and and not ever have to think about you as, unless it's something that has to be done by them. Yeah, I love that. That's great. So I, I always love hearing these stories of people who are starting up their own stu- their own spaces and how they got going with it. And uh, the idea that you were able to convince the school to like work out that sort of situation for you, like that that's amazing. That's like quick thinking, you know. <laughs> yeah, it was it worked out great too. Because um, you know, for two years I had no rent to pay and no electric bill to pay, no phone bill to pay. Uh, I could just all I had to do was make the payments on the Pro Tools, you know, and. Uh, and so I started buying equipment right away, you know, because I had some extra money because I was getting basically paid for two jobs at that time. And uh, so once I had enough clients built up after two years, then it was smart to move to my own space because I knew I could support it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a big thing that a lot of studios don't do and, and all kinds of businesses is they, they commit to paying rent and a, a high overhead when they don't yet have the customer base built up and then they're struggling and they're, or, you know, they may be working a, a day job and u- using all their money to pay the rent on their studio. And it, you know, that's, that's a really risky way to do it. I think it's better to find a way to get a client base before you start making financial commitments. It's a really good point. Yeah. I think a lot of people have this mentality of if they build it, they will come and, all that really typically happens with that is a lot of debt and no clients still. So yeah, it's yeah, it takes time. Yeah, it took me two years, but I had the advantage of being in a recording school. So I was meeting all these different groups of students and bands that would come in to record at the school, and and then meeting all the pe- all their friends, you know, and and I had a really good crop of people. And it was the mid '90s in San Francisco, which was a really good time for bands. There was a lot going on. So I was really fortunate, just the timing of everything. It was also right when the digital revolution happened. You know, I was I learned on analog, on a 24-track and, and a console. And then um, right after I graduated, pretty much, it was when Pro Tools started getting real, you know. And so I was able to sort of straddle both of those worlds, the analog and the digital. And... It was, you know, buying a Pro Tools system all of a sudden was such an efficient way to work for me 
Um, it's just, I don't know, the timing was just perfect. I was about to buy ADATs and a Mackie, which was the thing to do right around then in the early 90s. And then all of a sudden, Pro Tools dropped, you know, 16 track. I said, oh, this is what you got to do. You know? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that also gave you a leg up, too, because, yeah, as you built those efficiencies into your workflow and just use, even just using Pro Tools and having that there, I'm sure that made made things work a lot smoother for you. Yep. Yeah. Pro Tools has been like my main thing for all these years, uh, 27 years. Yeah. And uh, I, I use it for mastering because it's just what I know. You know, uh, most mastering guys are using something else, but I, I'm just, I've been using Pro Tools every day for so long that all the key commands and everything are just second nature. And so that, it's worth it to me to put up with the other little incon- inconveniences of mastering sure. and Pro Tools. Well, it's like when you know your DAW well enough, why try to, like, why force yourself to try to learn something from scratch? It would drive me nuts, you yeah. know, <laughs> going in and so like, what, you know, command. Z doesn't do the same thing. What, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, well, it's funny because I know that, like, Logic, for example, you can actually import, like, Pro Tools key commands and stuff like that. But, like, I mean, oh. at that point, like, yeah, I, I don't know. It, it's not very consistent. And, and uh, you know, there's features in there that don't apply to Pro Tools and vice versa. So, you know, it, it's not always as easy as doing that. But yeah, it's not. They're, they're, their editing is so different in Logic. For sure. So you had mentioned, like, I I love the idea of, you know, how you got started with this. And you had mentioned the idea of people taking on spaces and getting gear, but without having clients. So I'm curious to get your thoughts on, you know, for anyone who is getting started with this stuff, like, where does someone begin to find clients? Hmm. Nowadays, it's pretty different from when I started. um, Because, you know, the internet was just barely getting going at that time, too. And so we didn't have Facebook, you know, I think maybe MySpace, maybe, but I'm not even sure when that started. But so anyway, there was no, not all this social media. Um, so there, that wasn't really a way to promote. So what I did was, well, I was meeting clients through the school, but also I would I'd go to people's shows. And there was a lot of concerts you know, or a lot of venues around town back then, especially and, um, you know, I just meet people and network and not be pushy or salesman at all, but just hang out with people and it just kind of comes naturally, you know. And the other thing is whatever clients you do get in the beginning, you got to really make sure that they're going to refer your other people to you. Like not by asking them to, but by making sure they're really satisfied with what you did and that they got it at a good value because... That's what people want. Most musicians don't have a ton of money and they don't want to they don't want to spend too much, but they want it to sound pro and they want to enjoy the process. You know, um, mm-hmm. you got to make it. So, I mean, just basically do a really good job and um, people will tell other people. And through all these years I've been in business, 95 percent of my work has come from word of mouth referrals. Yeah. Um, so that other five percent you can get from a little bit of social media and um, posting on forums, you know, uh, Yelp reviews or Google reviews. Um, so that little 5% is what you start out with, I guess, if you don't know anybody. It just gets a snowball going kind of thing. Right. Yeah. You know, you get, a, you get a few clients and they hopefully come back to you and tell other people. And it just, you have to wait for it to develop to the point where it's making sense to put money into it because you don't want to put money in that it's not going to pay for itself. You don't want to buy gear or or a space that's not going to pay for itself. And so it's just being a smart business person, you know. For sure. Yeah, income versus expenses. Like, it's like business 101, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, Yeah, but I mean, all kinds of businesses fail to do that because they want it. You know, they just, they want to be in business. And I get that. I wanted it too. But I waited until I had the clients before I did it. And yeah. so I was, like I said, I was fortunate and I had that deal with the school and I get how hard it is. So I guess if I was starting out freelance engineer, um, not doing the intern, work your way up to second engineer kind of thing, but starting out independent, I would be trying to find a studio to work out of. Like I have a young engineer working out of my studio in my off hours now 
because I stopped doing recording and mixing and I'm just doing mastering now ever since the pandemic hit. And so he, you know, he has another job too, but he comes in and does sessions a couple hours here and there and before I come in or after I leave. And so if you can get in with someone like that, where you can start doing some sessions and meeting clients and getting your own reputation, establishing yourself before you start going off and, you know, diving in with both jumping in with both feet, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's interesting. You brought up a good point there about getting that snow, snowball ru- rolling and basically, you know, that 5% turned into, you know, that, that turned into so many more clients just by having, you know, by doing a great job building systems to, to generate more leads and, and customers. Um, and you, you had mentioned kind of in passing, you had mentioned like the idea of like Yelp reviews or Google reviews, that kind of stuff. Is that something that you make part of your regular process with, with the artists that you work with, where you try to encourage them to do that kind of thing? No, I don't ask for reviews. I mean, I maybe, I think maybe I have a couple of times, um, years ago, like you just sort of nudge, nudge someone a little bit, <laughs> you know, you could, you could write a review if you're really happy, you know, but once you get a few up there, then you don't really need to think about it anymore because there's enough, you know? So, I mean, I have, I think I have 16 reviews on my Google for my studio and that's a lot for around here. And so it's enough, you know, where people can say, okay, there's 16 five-star reviews. I don't really even need to read them, you know? Yeah. It's kind of funny how, how few studios actually take advantage of that and, and use it, use it to attract people. And so, yeah, 16 reviews, isn't that, isn't that much, especially if you've been in business for as long as you have, but, but the fact that you've got more than everyone else makes you stand out above the rest, right? Yeah. For mastering anyway, or in the Bay area, I think I have more, um, there's some recording studios that have huge numbers. Um, but you know, it just has to be enough to where if someone's looking at it, they can see it's consistently good reviews and over a period of time, you know, and Google, I will mention is by far the best resource for, for traffic to my website. Like, you know, that my web host, uh, gives me data, um, analytics and, uh, the vast majority of new or I don't want to say new. What's the word? Um, well, the ones that you can see that come from a source, because some of them you can't tell where they came from, but the vast majority of it is, is through Google. So you want to have a good, you want to look good on Google. You know, if you're, if you're a studio or if you're in any way searchable on Google, you want to make sure that that's a good look because that's where the most people are looking. And it makes sense because, yeah, you're right. People are looking up a recording studio near me or something like that. And right. if you pop up, then yeah, like I, th- I think I read something that like the, if you're within the first 10 results on Google, like you have like a significantly higher traffic flow than anybody who's on page two. Like it, like it dramatically drops off if you're on like the next 10 results. So you have to basically try to get on that first page as much as possible. Yeah. And I'm not on the first page except in, if you're searching local right here in my yeah. area. Um, but if, you know, if you're like where you are and you search for a mastering studio, I'm going to be on like page 20 or something, you know, but in the Bay area, if you say mastering studio near me, then I'm in the first page. And so, uh, I, and, and it's also true that 75% of my business comes from the Bay area. Um, so, so but, yeah, that's the power of Google right there. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing, too, that's great about the Internet that I guess everybody knows is that you can work with clients from all over the world. Of course. Um, and especially in mastering. I've got people from every continent sending me, except Antarctica, <laughs> sending me. Um, not yet. <laughs> yeah, not yet. i got to get that break into that Antarctica yeah. market. <laughs> get in those Google reviews. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Well, yeah, so, I mean, it's it's... I, I love hearing stories about how people are getting their studios going because because I hundred percent agree with you about everything you've covered so far. Just like the idea of renting, the idea of like if you're going to go in it, you should have the clientele there and not be spending all your money up front. Like there's there's so many things that people need to consider if they're going to try to do this on a professional level. Yeah, um, it's it's called a business plan. You know? yeah. <laughs> and my dad made me do that when um, when I started out because I needed a credit card to get 
the Pro Tools, and I didn't yet have a credit card at that point. And so he said, well, I'll co-sign a credit card, but I need to see your business plan. I was like, what's a business plan? And, you know, he's like, well, you got to sh- put it on paper, show me how is this going to work mathematically, you know. And that was the greatest exercise for me because I said, okay, well, you know, it's going to cost me this much in the payments, so I'd have to work this many hours to make those payments, and then yada, yada. You know, you go down the line, just whatever your costs are, whatever, you know, you need to live, and, and you just write it all down, do the math. And going through that process is really really makes you think and i recommend doing it before you start any venture yeah of course that's it's it's such a big part of the process that so many people don't do because they either don't know about it or don't know how to do it or you know they just no one's ever shown them that that process yeah, but what but it's, right. it's, it's it's very critical yeah um you had also mentioned the idea of internships and you know that that's obviously been a path that for decades people have followed to get into this industry do you feel like it is necessary to have an internship these days to to succeed in music or or can people just start from scratch and just kind of do it the way I guess the way you did it to some degree? You can do it either way. You know, it's whatever opportunities are there for you. If you're in a place where there is a studio that's accepting interns and you haven't gone to recording school, um that's a great way to learn and you know, I have a couple of friends who did that in San Francisco. And one of them is now a very, well, Jamie Durr, he was on your show yeah, yeah. recently. He's great. Yeah. He started off interning at coast recorders and he's like doing really well now, you know, he's working, doing a lot of work with some major label artists. And so, yeah, that's you know, awesome. so you can do that. You can do that if you're patient and, and, um, determined, you know, it takes time to work your way up just from scratch. Then, yeah, I think no matter which way you go, determination is key because you're either going to get burnt out from being an intern and not doing the things that you really want to be doing, or you're going to get burnt out from like trying to run your business and you know trying to market yourself and do all those things that go into it, right? Yeah, absolutely. You have to really want it um, and be willing to put in the work over the long period to get, uh, you know, just to get going. And then once you're going. You still got to want it and you still got to be determined. And because <laughs> running, running an independent business, you know, you're doing everything. I mean, I guess, you know, I could hire an assistant, but I, you know, I don't want to do that. I just don't want to have that. So I, you know, I'm answering the phone and cleaning the place and just doing everything because I don't really have interns either. I used to have a few, but I just, now that I'm just doing mastering, that doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. Or they're just going to sit there, you know. Yeah. So I'd love to talk about the mastering. Like, correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, you, you did start your, your studio originally as like a, tr- a place for tracking and full production, right? And then over the years, you've transitioned into mastering. So uh, like, tell us a little bit more about kind of what that transition was like and why you made that. Yeah, sure. Well, it wasn't so much of a transition. I For about 25 years, I was doing 50% mastering and 50% recording mixing. Because right in the beginning... The first band I ever recorded, wh- they um, didn't have any money for mastering. Ironically, the band's name was Poverty, and um, they so they there was what well, can't you just do it? And so it was Pro Tools with like the L1 limiter and just the stock plugins at that time, you know. And I did a you know by modern standards a half-assed job, but it was passable enough and. So that happened with a lot of people. They, they, you know, can't you just do it? And so I just got better at it. And then when I started realizing that it was going to be a thing, I started buying outboard gear so I could get a better sound and got a tube EQ and a tube compressor and, you know, um, started working that side of the business in addition to buying microphones and everything else I was doing to set up uh, better speakers, you know, room treatment, all of that. Um, So it was a gradual ramp up of mastering equipment and experience while I was also doing recording and mixing. And I worked a lot of hours for a lot of years. I was a workaholic and in 
recently I've eased off a bit. You get exhausted eventually after a few couple of decades, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, so yeah, I, so I was doing mastering and recording mixing all that time, and then in the last say five years, I started deciding, okay, I'm getting older. I'm getting tired of crawling around on the floor and plugging in mics and doing these long sessions and uh, mixing has always been kind of exhausting for me because of the amount of con sustained mental focus it takes. Um, and so I just said, you know, I think I might have enough mastering clients to just do mastering because I had been making mastering clients wait because I had all these recording sessions booked. And so I was losing some mastering clients. So I said, okay, I'm going to raise the price of recording and mixing so that I get less of that work. And because I was underpriced and then let mastering fill in the gaps and it worked. And so I was on that path up until 2020. I probably by then I was about 80% mastering and 20% recording mixing. And then when the pandemic hit, I just said, went, I just closed down the recording studio completely. And so I just don't want to have people coming in. You know, it was the, the lockdown in, in March of 2020. So I just said, okay, it's all, all mastering now. And, um, you know, again, I was fortunate because what happened when there was a lockdown was people couldn't play shows. So they were just recording. And so the mastering work picked up uh, when the pandemic hit because there's all these recordings being made. And it's been that way for a couple of years. It's been busy. So, you know, here's hoping the pandemic never ends. <laughs> <laughs> People are going to be cursing your names right now. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I can, I can take, we can edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> but that's amazing. Like, I, you know, it you saw an opportunity there and you capitalized on that and that's great. And I, and I think that, you know, you needed to take that risk to, to see like, you know, if I boost my prices on the the mixing and the, the full production stuff, like, is it going to really work out? And yeah. I, I, you know, I'm sure you still got some people that wanted your mixing services at the higher price, which might have yeah. been nice, but, but it also allowed you to transition as well. Right. And make more money. Yeah. You know, can't forget about that. We need money. And so, and the, um, the nice thing now is that actually, you know, mastering pays better by the hour than recording and mixing generally, because once you've got enough experience at mastering, you can do it pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So charge by the song, you know, if you do two songs an hour at 50 or 60 bucks a song, that's good pay, you know? Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I, I was curious about that as well. Like, you know, with mastering, it's more of a high volume of clients with lower dollar price points versus the full production side of things where it's usually fewer clients, but higher price points in general. So, you know, I was curious about how you how, what your experience has been with that. But I guess that that's your answer right there, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, for for a long time, I knew that mastering paid better, um, you know, in terms of time, you know, hours, like I was saying. Um, but I wanted to do both because uh, I enjoyed the variety and I like recording and working with people in, in the studio, you know, in a recording session or a mixing session. Um, and just after 25 years or, or so, or, you know, 22 years, I started to burn out on it. It's, it's mm -hmm. a long time. And, you know, if I had told my younger self that that would happen, I wouldn't have believed me, you know. But uh, after time, you, you just, you know, you get tired of just doing the same Thanks. So focusing into one thing also is allows me to really throw myself into it. Whereas I was kind of a jack of all trades before. Now I'm really focused on one thing and it, I think it really sharpens me is, is, is it's all I think about when I'm thinking about my work is, is about mastering. And I feel like in the last couple of years, I've made some leaps and bounds in terms of um, what I can do and how efficiently I can do it. And also in, um, figuring out some of the best gear to get from that, that works with my workflow, you know, and my 
personal taste. That's what one thing I would mention too is that to people that are starting out is clients are paying you one one of the things they're paying you for or hiring you for is your taste. You you have to have um, musical taste or a sonic taste that agrees or that they like, you know, so that you get results that they like. And there's a lot of engineers that have different approaches and you end up with people gravitating to you who agree with you on how things should sound, because those are the ones that refer people to you and that are the ones that come back to you. So don't be afraid to, you know, stake out your sound or and the way you want to do things. You know, for me, it was a lot of analog outboard gear, analog tape, warm, big, bold sounds. And uh, some engineers are more about like what they call like high fidelity, which is like super crispy, clean, high end. And, you know, and where things are more like, say, like a Steely Dan sound, you know, um, and I'm more of like a Led Zeppelin sound or, you know, something like just just more like, I don't know, you know, I think that's a good enough analogy. But um, so anyway, yeah, make your sound stick with it. And then the people that, well, hopefully somebody likes that sound, right? And then they are the ones that you'll be un- end up working with. And then everybody's happy. That's a good point. The other thing is like when a lot of people are starting off in this industry, they, they feel like they need to do everything and try to attract everyone. And, you know, sometimes that's not the best way. It puts you down a, a path that you don't want to go down. Yeah. You also have to, though, to figure out what your sound is and what you're good at. And so you do have to kind of in the beginning just sort of take what comes through the door uh, and try it. So I, I did. I tried to do some things that didn't really pan out, you know, um, but that's how I learned that, you know, you have to try and you never know. You might find all of a sudden you're like really good at producing podcasts or you're, you know, there's all kinds of things you can do in audio besides mm-hmm. just record bands. But, or you, you know, you just may find that, wow, I'm really good with acoustic singer songwriters and who knew, you know? And, yeah. Yeah. I know, I know a guy who got into this thinking he was going to be like, you know, Grammy award winning music engineer working on all these songs. And then he discovered he was really good at forensic audio. And so, oh, like, wow. you know, there's there's weird niches for that kind of stuff, right? It's like you learn you learn the skills and you can apply them however you want and you find the things that you like, right? Yeah, you may end up doing live sound or, you know, you, I mean, the, like, doorways open for you that you don't necessarily expect. And, you know, I could have gone into, like, audiobooks or, you know, there's just so many different things you can do. So you sort of see where the path leads you and what opportunities present themselves. And then you have to be able to seize the opportunities to recognize them and seize them and um, follow through, you know, of course. Yeah. So when it comes to your studio, like obviously you have a facility that still is very capable of doing the full production side of things. Do you have a preference for mastering versus doing the full production side? Now I do just because I'm lazy. Um, (laughs) It, it's, uh, like I said, I got tired of the long hours, you know, and also it's money, you know, like I said, it pays better. And, you know, so I'm like in my mid fifties now, and I have to think about that. I have to save for my retirement. Um, you know, when I was in my twenties and thirties, I I didn't think about that, about money very much, as long as I had enough to get by. Mm -hmm. And now I, you know, I have to plan. So, um, yeah, I gotta, you know, do, I kind of have to do what's going to pay the bills long term. Yeah. Well, that was another question I had for you is like, you know, how are you like when it comes to making decisions for your business, you know, how do you strike that balance between doing the things that you love versus the things that are more for the money side of it? You know, like I, I think I already said, I, you know, for most of my career, I've been doing kind of was a jack of all trades in the in music production. Um, and so I was kind of, I was just kind of doing everything. And then in recent years, the move to mastering was coincidentally more financially rewarding, but it's what I wanted to do anyway. Yeah. Because just because, like I said, I'm lazy and I'm tired now and it's shorter hours and, you know. Um, but it's not like you didn't enjoy doing that that work. You enjoy no, it. So, it you know, I mean, I could it. tell you a part I left out of my, um, my how you got into into 
production work story, which was mastering, was something I was doing crudely at home when I was, I don't know, in my 20s. I would make uh, compilation cassette tapes from my vinyl collection. Uh, you know, put a bunch of songs from different albums or different bands on the same cassette. And I was always frustrated that they didn't match. Uh, you know, I tried to set the level the same on the cassette deck, but they, you know, some songs were brighter, some songs were darker, some seemed louder, whatever. And I was like, why do different songs by the same band, but on different albums, sound so different? And I didn't understand. I didn't know what mastering was. And when I went to recording school, oh, so, sorry, I'm going a little out of order. So I started using a graphic equalizer between my turntable and my cassette deck. And so I was EQing mixes and basically sort of, you know, home crude mastering so just so that my tapes would play in the car without <laughs> me having to reach for the controls, you know. And um, but then when I was in recording school, we had a day where we talked about mastering and this huge light bulb went on. So I knew right then that that was something I wanted to learn more about. And so I was into the idea from the beginning, as soon as I knew what it was. So, and when I started my studio, I told myself, I'll, I may end up just doing mastering and, you know, when I'm old. So now I guess I'm old, according to myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you found, you found what you like doing, right? Like, you, yeah, you, I do. Sometimes you just have I to be exposed like it. to it to realize like, oh, this is, this is what I like. This, I, I'm into this idea. Yeah. Yeah, and it's so it's it's kind of like the same as like when I was a little kid and I had the cassette recorder, and you know I was fascinated with that. And then as soon as I learned what mastering was, I was really fascinated because I was like, well, wait, you know how how do they do that? You know, and and you start you know, when you first start learning about what is mastering, you start you know you hear about like oh they've got all this special gear that sprinkles fairy dust and you know <laughs> makes everything sound better and. And it's kind of true, you know, but it's it, there's a lot more to you it. You have than a fairy that. dust machine. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's my secret, yeah. my secret fairy dust machine. I don't want to tell you where I got it. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's um, you know. So I started reading as much as I could about it, and um, just always made it a priority you know, to learn about mastering and just get more experience with it. Yeah. So I really liked what Noah Mintz said on your show, uh, his story about the Nike logo, and where he said, you're not paying me for this 30 minutes, you're paying me for 30 years, mm -hmm. you know, or something like that. And, yeah. um, and uh, that's, that's really true, you know, with choosing, I mean, any kind of an engineer, you want to get somebody that's got some experience, if you can. And if they don't have experience, then you want them to work cheap, you know, if you're the client. Because if you don't have experience, it's going to take longer to get to where you want to go. It's kind of like that uh, that good, fast, cheap kind of Venn diagram, right? Like you're right. trying to find that like happy middle ground. Choose two. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everyone wants all three, but yeah, you have yeah. to basically choose two, right? Well, you know, try, I tried to do all three. My, my, when I first started... My goal was to do all three. I said, I want to give people major label sound at a cheap price so that ordinary people can afford it, you know, and make it really efficient and fun. And that was, you know, my goal was to do all three. Like, I don't know, you know, I guess I did well enough at that that I was able to establish a business, but you can't really do all three fully. Mm -hmm. That was my goal, though. That was my, my part. Of, I wrote it in my business plan. <laughs> <laughs> do you ever revisit that old business plan to, to no see? i don't have it i wish i oh. did i'd like to see it. maybe my dad has it yeah you should definitely check with it and that, that'd be great to see like how how much of that has come true right yeah that's a good idea i'll see if i can find that <laughs> <laughs> do you think it's important for people who are getting into mastering to at least have experience first as a mixing engineer i think it's important i like it you don't have to but yeah, you know, it's, I think there's a few mastering engineers that were never mixing engineers, but I think the majority of us were mixing and recording engineers before getting into mastering. Some, some of them, some are really good producers and, and musicians on their own. Um, I think it's important to be a musician too, and to have experience being on the other side of the glass, you know, mm -hmm. um, um, but 
none of those things are absolutely necessary. It's, you know, there's always exceptions, but I think it's, it's pretty true that having an understanding of what the musician is going through and what the client is going through. And then when you're doing mastering, your client is another engineer sometimes. So you're, you're working for mix engineers or producers or labels, you know, and these are people that have their own experience and opinions and so no, but it, but it's true though when you're working with other engineers like these people do come into it with their own perspectives and that that is something to also consider as a mastering engineer it's like what kind of mastering engineer are you going to be are you going to be the person that you know is like the subtle engineer or the person who's like very drastic with the changes and and then to your earlier point of attracting the people that you want to work with like that's going to be part of it right yeah Absolutely. Um, mastering is totally an area where you, you, you have to kind of stake out a, a sound. I mean, and l- even if that sound is being transparent, that's still your sound. Um, so I know a lot of mastering engineers say that, you know, um, I like to be invisible. You know, I just do my job and like, you don't even know I did it. And I've always thought I wouldn't want to pay someone t- for that because I, I just do it myself. You know, if, if I was just going to make it louder or whatever, or just do a few little tweaks, I could figure out how to do that myself. If I'm the client, imagining myself as a client, I would want to, someone to, I would want to hear some, some kind of mojo, you know, some kind of sweetening enhancement of the sound and not just, okay, now the songs are all the same level and the same frequency response. Yeah, it's a harder sell to tell people like, yeah, I'm just going to keep it basically the way you gave it to me. But yeah, a and they're like, <laughs> what do I need you for then? You know, or what you know. So I always felt like just my instinct was that clients want to hear something for their money. You know, they want to hear some improvement, some something that makes them smile. So that's why I started buying all that analog equipment in the beginning, and and I still do. Um, and because I find I get more of satisfaction with hardware, you know, real tubes and transformers and saturation devices and things that uh, in the analog domain is where I've learned how to do that. I'm not saying that people can't do that in digital mastering. I just don't know how to. And so, you know, I'm just doing what I know. So you set out, you know, your sound, my sound was like I was saying earlier, more of like a big, big, bold sound kind of a thing, like rocking sound, you know, and it works well. I have a lot of hip hop clients too. Um, so it's rock, metal, and hip hop are the main things I do, but I also do a lot of everything. But um, everything except classical, I don't get any of that. That's like a whole separate world. Um, I think people want to hear something. And so that's what I do. I do what I think sounds good. And then the people who like it are the ones that come back. If someone doesn't like it, then they can ask for a free revision and I can give them something different. And those people, um, you know, in general, probably don't, they probably keep looking for someone that gets it on the first try or, you know, has a different kind of aesthetic. Uh, So we're all out there. There's so many mastering engineers now. You know, you can find, you can look at uh, some recordings that you like, some albums that sound the way you like, and look up who mastered it or who mixed it, you know. And you can also learn a lot by, if you're an aspiring engineer, by doing that same thing and reading up now all the volumes of information online about how they did it. Yeah, there's so much information out there that, like, yeah, you can learn this stuff relatively easily. Yeah. Well, there's, well, they're all on these podcasts, you know. It's true. Like, <laughs> and then the, then there's all these YouTube videos, and then there's you know um, forums, and you can find if you just are, are diligent, you can find all kinds of information about how things were done on yeah. all these albums. Well, I feel like I've had so many mastering engineers on the podcast lately, just by pure coincidence. But it's been it's been great to learn more about kind of the the process that people are implementing and and all the uh, the tools that people are using. And and uh, yeah, just I'm just trying to reveal what everyone's Fairy Dust three thousand is. You know, like what's what's that magic thing that they're doing? <laughs> yeah, you know, and so uh, like your you said your show is is focused a lot, or a lot of your listeners are um, home recordists or um, up and coming engineers. I want to stick with what I said earlier is that you don't want to be spending thousands of dollars when you're not earning anything, unless you just really want to own that stuff for your own personal pleasure. But if it's a business thing, don't do that right away. 
Um, so, and the reason I'm saying that is because like my secret 3000, whatever fairy dust is, um, mostly expensive hardware. So there's like $50,000 worth of gear in this room. And I would Some never people have can't done even make that first hundred dollars. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. You know, you, so like I, like when I started mastering, it was just, um, L one limiter and, and stock pro tools plugins, you know, and, and I was doing it for $25 an hour in 1995, you know, 90, $1995. Um, and that was super cheap. So I was like, well, what, you know, no one would say, oh, it's, it, I didn't get what I paid for because I was doing it so cheap and I was just getting the experience and then just started adding in the equipment gradually one piece at a time as it paid for itself. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so that's how I did it. That's how I recommend doing it. I did carry some debt for a while because I got impatient and I I bought like a, a 24 track tape machine and a, an Ampex two track mastering machine analog <clears throat> for uh, on like credit lease to own kind of a thing where they just rake you over the coals and you, know, you end up paying double <laughs> and you know over the years but uh, but I I wanted those tape machines you know so I did take on some debt for a while but. Um, once you get out of debt, which is the way I've been now for quite a few years, it's a really good feeling because you can actually start saving and have a little cushion in the bank, which is really makes you sleep at night. So if you have a slow month, you don't panic. Yeah, it's good to actually be able to enjoy your life and not feel like you're constantly paying back debts to the bank. Yeah, interest, you know, and these days interest rates, well, depending on, I mean, on credit cards, they're still really high. Um, even though like savings don't pay you anything. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, put it all in Bitcoin. Yeah. Isn't that what the, <laughs> the, the governor of, or the, the pre- president of El Salvador or something like that recently did put all their, mo- <laughs> put the whole country's money in Bitcoin. <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, okay. Well, it's a risky move, but hey, maybe no. it'll work for him. Who knows? <laughs> no, no corruption in El Salvador. No. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's really interesting to hear like all of your philosophies on getting into the studio and 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 you know, I love I love everything you've said here about just like being business minded with the whole thing. So now that you're at a point where your business has gone 100 percent mastering, you still have this big facility. Do you ever see yourself downsizing that? I'm mainly keeping this going just out of inertia right now because I've, I've been in here so long. The idea of taking it apart and cleaning it up is daunting. You know, when you're in a space this long that every corner is filled with something and I've got a storage room upstairs that is terrifying. And it's um, so the idea of moving the studio is is nightmarish, but it would make sense if I could get a, a much cheaper rent in a smaller space just to do mastering. So what I'm doing instead of that is uh, letting um, my other engineer work a little bit in recording sessions, which makes enough to actually pay the difference in rent that probably would be if I, if I downsized and, uh, and that way I don't also have to sell all my favorite toys. You know, I've got all True. this. You still like having that stuff, right? You yeah. get to have fun with it still. Yeah, all my microphones and my preamps and compressors, you know, that the, that I don't use for mastering. It's about half of my gear. And and that's all hand-picked over decades. And, you know, I did a lot of buying and selling and in order to end up with just the things I like. Yeah. But, hey, you, you've, you've earned those things and you've paid them off. So they're not – if it's right. causing you debt, then, yeah, get rid of it. But, yeah, if you're if – you're, paid off and you're enjoying that why not right have have fun with it yeah and the other thing is that the stuff some of it goes way up in value over time you know so the vintage stuff that i have the um i have you know some old rca preamps and old ampex and um i have like lang eqs and you know the stuff is going through the roof and the longer you keep it, the more it's worth. So it's kind of a little retirement plan to, you know, just have this stuff. And then maybe in another 10 years, just sell everything and have some money, you know, have some retirement money. Yeah, there you go. That, hey, that's not a bad way of thinking about it either. 
I, I remember hearing like I used to work at an old music store and, and one of my bosses there was a big guitar collector. And he used to always say the same thing. He's like, these things go up in value. And one day this is a retirement fund. And in the meantime, I get to play with these toys and have fun. And it's not yeah. not just a boring stock or something like that, like that I have no control over. I, I get to enjoy this now, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's it's kind of, you know, I, I, I wish I'd kept some stuff that I sold years ago because it's gone up so much. Um, I said, oh, I should just stuck that in, in the storage room if I wasn't going to use it. And then I could have sold it for triple now, you know, uh, yeah. D72 preamps that I sold, you know, during the the Great Recession, just to pay the bills that month, you know, and, uh, and now uh, I, well, I would use those too, if I still had them. But yeah. So, you know, that's something too, I can say is that when you're buying, when you buy really nice gear, whether it's musical instruments, or, um, you know, rack gear or microphones think twice before you sell it like it's like selling your favorite guitar or selling a really nice guitar you know one day you you know you're gonna wish you had that and so um you know sell it if you have to but think twice because you probably never get another one yeah but going back to your earlier point like you know be buying it when you can afford it and not necessarily right out of debt no it's yeah i think that is the balance with engineers right it's like we all lust after gear thinking like this is gonna make our stuff sound so much better and sometimes it does so, but mm. but usually the difference that, that you get out of it isn't as significant as your brain makes it out to be before you own it right <laughs> yeah and you might you might give up you know you might say okay i want i want this piece of gear so i'm going to sell these other two pieces of gear to pay for it and then mm -hmm. you may realize oh, i was getting more out of those two pieces because i didn't know this new piece of gear yet and it was a chance I took and you know sometimes you know hopefully on the whole when you make those kind of decisions you end up making progress but there are times where you regret it so uh, I'm not saying don't do it I'm just saying think twice you know think twice before you buy and think twice before you sell just make smart um, business decisions yeah 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 for sure like Barack Obama said don't do stupid shit <laughs> 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 right on, man. Well, I think that's the, the perfect closing line to end on here. <laughs> Justin, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I, I really do appreciate it. I don't want to take up too much more of your day. So, uh, but, I, but I really appreciate it. And I think this is something that truthfully on the podcast, we haven't really dove into too much is like this idea of getting started with your with your studio. And, you know, a lot of these things like business plans and that kind of stuff, like, we haven't really talked about that too much on this podcast, so it's really refreshing to hear it. And I, I think there's, I think there's going to be a lot of people that listen to this and have that kind of revelation of like, oh yeah, I need, I need to get my shit together. I need to actually focus on the right areas. So I think this is going to be really helpful for a lot of people. Good. I hope it is. So that was my interview with Justin Weiss, and I love that interview. I thought it was super, super helpful. And I know that some of you are probably listening to it thinking, man, like. I need to rethink my business. And that's a good thing. If that's how you feel about this episode, that's actually a good thing. It's it's always good to reflect back on how your business is operating and how you're going about spending money and also making money. And if you want to make this a career that you last in, you have to make smart business decisions. So I definitely think it's worth revisiting this episode to listen back to a lot of those great points that Justin brought up because these are things that can ultimately, if you do go down the route of trying to run a commercial facility, these are the things that are ultimately going to keep you in business. So you need to approach things carefully. So yeah, I really enjoyed that. Justin, thanks again for being on the podcast. You're awesome. Love to have you back at some point. And for you, the listener, I hope that you enjoyed that episode just as much as I did. And if you did, definitely make sure to subscribe to this podcast. That way you're notified about all new episodes as they go live each and every Wednesday morning. And also make sure to visit MasterYourMix.com. That is a site where I help out musicians with their home studios, and I help you create pro-sounding recordings with ease. And one resource that you're going to want to check out on the website is called The Mixing Mindset. That is a book that I put out a while ago that walks you through the entire process of mixing your songs from beginning to end, and it tells you all of the tools that you need to know, all of the things you need to listen out for, and it's just going to give you a very clear path so that you don't feel overwhelmed or feel like you're constantly second-guessing your work. I'm going to give you all the steps to follow to make your life easy. So check that out. It's called The Mixing Mindset, and that's available at MasterYourMix.com. So that is it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it, and I can't wait to talk to you in the next one. We'll talk soon. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Master Your Mix podcast. To have your questions answered, submit your questions to questions at MasterYourMix.com. Please go to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. 
And for more information on how you can improve your mixes, visit MasterYourMix.com.